Welcome all. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, once again, welcome uh, at the public seminar uh, about uh, hospitality, which is a part of um, uh, one month uh, uh, residency program called Redirecting East 2018, which main subject is the notion of uh, hospitality. Uh, the this is the bigger question which, uh, which is addressed to our uh, selected uh, curators, uh, activists, uh, who were uh, invited uh, to this year's uh, edition of Redirecting uh, East. And um, uh, we will, uh, for a whole month, the curators, uh, during the uh, sessions, seminar sessions, meetings, workshops, uh, try to deliver an uh, answer for uh, some uh, bigger questions regarding uh, the hospitality in the context of curatorial, artistic and institutional practice. In uh, January, hospitality even possible uh, in artistic environment. How can hospitality and care be applied as a resistance strategy against oppressive structures and uh, systems. So those were very initial questions uh, which we addressed to, um, to our uh, wonderful uh, curators. And uh, for the whole month uh, as well, the curators work on uh, and develop the paper proposals. And for today's um, open public seminar, uh, we decided to divide uh, this uh, meeting in two parts. The first one will be the uh, presentation of every single six uh, paper proposals and um, notion of hospitality through the lens of individual um, uh, curators. And afterwards we engage you as a, uh, our guests um, uh, to uh, take a notes, uh, questions, comments, and share with us openly. Here is not a very formal meeting, so you are very welcome to participate in, um, in the session uh, in this second part. Uh, so we will like to create uh, a very democratic uh, situation of uh, shared knowledge. So, uh, so that's the structure of uh, today's uh, public uh, public seminar. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce uh, our first first um, speaker and uh, and first curator, uh, which is Khadija de Paula. Um, uh, Khadija de Pal uh, Palma, in her practice, combines food, text, and performance to create the situation and happenings that question the value of labor, resource, and social habits. Uh, with um, Khadija, uh, Khadija uh, has an IMBA uh, in arts administration from uh, Schulich School of uh, Business uh, at York University and BFA in photography from OC8 uh, University, both in Toronto. So, uh, uh, Khadija, if I can uh, have you first, and the floor is yours. Hello. Hello. Is it on? Yes. Working? Okay. So, sorry, probably going to be a little bit boring. I'm going to read something for you. Uh, Hopefully, no more than 15 minutes. Um, well, Conrad, Ika, Mariana, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Today, when hospitality is very much the focus of this Redirecting East Curatorial Seminar, I would like to recall the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943. It is described as the largest single revolt by Jews during the Second World War. Worse genocides preceded and worse genocides followed it. Today, 75 years later, when there are few surviving eyewitnesses to the Second World War, we need to ask ourselves if we have really learned from history or not. 
Ghettos worldwide and through history, physical and mental, defined by walls and fences, purchase powers and ideologies, self-imposed and enforced, continue to experience genocide. The rich and optimized exterminating the poor and outdated, in competition for diminishing resources, victory to the Warsaw Ghetto an enlightenment and freedom for all the world's genocided suprematismus. You can create a memorial for all the mass murders in history in a preview of the next one, already unfolding, but putting Auschwitz in line with Jericho as events in the same tradition of genocidal mass murder might put you in Hell's Kitchen. The Nazis were the most madly and pervasively industrious but not the most efficient, effective, and successful murmur, mass murders in history. There are so many ghettos of poor, outcast, and chosen, enforced and elected by visible and invisible borders, like fences and credit card availabilities and limits, and soon fences across entire islands, regions, and maybe even continents, again, like in Roman times and those of ancient China and gated communities across the world. Despite the walls and fences and gates and ghettos of today, one of my colleagues says that humanity has never experienced such low mortality rates and that historically we are actually living a good time. Perhaps this is the point of view of those who did not experience actual destruction and can eat sushi and tapas over the rubbles of what is no longer here enjoying the landscape of modern office buildings replacing an old Russian church, and the glass tower of the insurance company standing where the largest synagogue used to be. To be honest, I too come from a ghetto. I'm a Polaca da Barreirinha da República de Curitiba, a new Christian from a South American dictatorship whose mediocre education was extraordinarily exemplar in the absolute disparities of the society I grew up in. My Brazilian roots made me a cordial woman who needs to expand my, by being social, to extend in the collective for not handling the weight of individuality, and thus seeks to live in the other. A migrant since my teens, I have also been living a nomadic, nostalgic life, longing for the socialism I never lived and questioning the origins of inequalities and the whys behind injustices. When I was invited to be part of Redirecting East, I was excited with the possibility of going as further east as I have ever been to meet people who due to geopolitical conditions I have not had the opportunity to collaborate with before. To me, hospitality is to take care of that that is different from you. And thus, the challenge of creating an environment where exchanging experiences and learning from one another beyond political clashes seem particularly appropriate in a time where we experience a level of polarization not seen in decades. If ambiguity of hospitality lies on the role of guest and host, or the attitudes of welcome and hostility, then hospitality is centered on the issue of shared resources, and ultimately, the question of property and power. As a property-less person whose practice is based and dependent on shared and ceded spaces, I have it clear that my international mobility is part of a contemporary migration movement led by the precarization of labor, and in my particular case, the scrapping of the arts. I also have it clear that institutions benefit from hosting residents as one of the cheapest possible forms of labor, providing housing and food in exchange of work. Yet, I'd rather be exploited by globalized neoliberalism than imprisoned by, my dictatorship, by the dictatorship of my home country. Departing from this particular context, which I find myself in, and the welcoming language used by Yuya Zdovsky in describing hospitality, not just as a key idea, but the very starting point for the seminar, 
I propose to focus my time and collective engagement with redirecting East participants on the way we share resources and exchange experiences as a group. I propose to bring our discourses to the body by maintaining a common space through a collective, generous effort of honest self and institutional critique through micropolitical acts, such as cleaning our common space, self-organizing our collective time, and bringing all participants and staff, regardless of function, to the same engagement level. However, from the very beginning, a polarizing atmosphere prevailed. Perhaps there was a widespread concern about whether sharing and collaborating was an actual way to develop something honestly and fairly, and whether everyone could be included. We all tried to foster collaboration at some point, but the common collective response was to go on our individual ways as soon as possible. In the very first days of the program, it became clear that even though we all talked about autonomous movements, precarious labor, gender politics, and popular struggles, no one picked up their dishes from the table. After the revolution, who is going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning? None of us, because the outsource cleaner will. There was no collective response aimed at resolving the great challenge of eating. The response to collective hunger was always resolved individually or by the staff on behalf of the group. This meant that we were never hungry, but we also rarely chose what to eat. The same happened with the program. Comparing to an ice cream menu, we were presented with the best flavors that exist, but there was no choice. We had to eat them all. In this month-long residency, this public seminar is probably the first opportunity we have to actually debate the topic of hospitality. Our program schedule was as packed and controlled as a nine-to-five office worker shift. And if, I ask, and if you ask me why I didn't question the program when it was presented to me, I'll tell you honestly that I didn't understand half of what was being said because of language, because of context, because I was rushed to the next activity without having any idea of what I was getting myself into. Once I understood, I had to attend to a compulsory program that I was not particularly interested in. Going against it became a very personal issue. How could a cordial woman like me question criticize or resist the hospitable and caring people that were embodying the very oppressive systemic structure imposed on them by the institutional environment. In every situation, there is a right, a left, and a center. The left wants to move, the right wants to stay put. The general rule is that the center, the great majority, remains under the heel of the right though through the law of inertia. You know what you're dealing with anyway. Let things stay the same, at least we're familiar with them. Committing yourself to something new is by definition risky. We did not come here to exchange, learn from each other, change ourselves or the world, but rather to gain and maintain access to the privilege to future work, even if precarious, low wage, without benefits, security, or dignity. In times of increased competition for diminishing resources, we will hold on to anything. No one is willing to lose, to risk, to change, or to challenge. We rather listen silently to what we do not understand or even disagree. Wait for it to be over, but we couldn't dare to interrupt, to be rude, to say no, or to voice the truth. That would be too much. It would be inappropriate. It could hurt future opportunities. And the future value of money is all that matters, and this is why, in the times we live in, artistic endeavors do not bring any real change. Artistic practices keep adjusting its methods in response to institutional offers that are shaped by capital demands. 
Today, in times of intensifying migration, we talk about hospitality. Yesterday, it was gender politics. The day before, it was climate change. But the institution won't stop printing catalogs that will end up in the garbage. We won't stop eating quinoa, avocado, or shrimps. Because no one dares to stop the machine. The leaf blower is a great example of that. He wakes me up every sunny day at 7.30 a.m., blowing leaves beside the laboratory building. For the institution, the landscape contractor, and the gardener, the leaf blower is a gift of God, saving hours of tedious raking and grooming, but the crude little two-stroke engine blower is a pollution bomb. Running it for 30 minutes creates more emission than driving a pickup truck for 6,000 kilometers. Those emissions constitute a public health hazard for anyone in the vicinity, but especially for the poor bastard running the thing at 100 decibels. But who cares about the lungs of the, or the ears of the leaf blower or the guards standing beside that comrade's sound blasting installation at the CCA day after day? The tragedy of the leaf blower is that it makes assholes of us all users, neighbors, and visitors alike. We can talk about hospitality as a revival of collective thinking and community stronghold. But if in real life we don't ask ourselves how we are feeling throughout the conversation, there is no point in talking about hospitality, community, or collectivity. We can talk about hospitality as a total system of universalism versus humanity, but if we stand a three hours theater play on modern slavery in Warsaw and cannot engage at a human level with the Ukrainian bum who asks for a cigarette in the intermission of the play, there is no hospitality or humanity that can be talked about. We can talk about hospitality as a tool for emancipation but if we do not let our administrative staff or intern present themselves as part of the team we call non-hierarchical, there is nothing for us to talk about. We cannot talk about hospitality and self-recognition if in the real life we don't hold the door for the other to enter the building we live in. There is nothing to be talked about. To me, the real moral sense which guides our social behavior is instinctive, based on sympathy and unity inherent in group life. Mutual aid is the condition of successful social living, and if we think that things are not being run fairly and mechanisms are not reciprocal, then we should seek for collaborative solutions and not individualistic responses which ultimately only serve to further isolation and protection. Protectionism, I'm sorry. I have tried to make clear to you what I believe hospitality is, and I think this always begins at the home, at the body. The more we succeed in overcoming divisions within and amongst ourselves, the more freedom we'll have to focus on solidarity, cooperation, and hospitality. Fundamentally, the solutions are always simple. We can leave no one behind. We must open the doors for each other, share the weight with one another, and know we cannot leave the cleaning for later because someone will end up doing it for us. I would like to thank you, Ika, Ola, Mariana, for receiving me here and for the efforts you made in being hospitable. I may not be the best guest, but I'm certainly an even worse hostage. I know it could have been worse, but it could have, so could have been better too. So please, let's try to learn from history and remember that freedom is a possibility only if you're able to say no. To step out of ideology hurts. It's a painful experience. You must force yourself to do it. It is a, the extreme violence of liberation. If you simply trust your spontaneous sense of well-being, you'll never be free. Freedom hurts, freedom kills. Khadija, thank you. One, yeah. Khadija, thank you very much for, uh, for this paper. Uh,
already uh, thoughts uh, and uh, uh, questions uh, gathered in my head. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Although this paper really calls for immediate response, <laughs> I think that we will hold on to the we will hold on to the to the program that that we have agreed upon, which is uh, which is that. Uh, Perhaps, uh, perhaps we can hold the the questions. That that's why we 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 uh, we have put those papers and and pens here for anybody who who would like to uh, not forget the the questions that are arising immediately after the the each presentation. So um, I guess that that we will probably stick to stick to the program. But I just wanted to. Um, Underline that that there is also like materials that we can, or um, tools that we can we can use to not to forget the uh, impressions. Um, I'm just voicing I'm just voicing something that has been agreed upon in the in the group before because we were thinking about it. What if there is and how? So this is how, what we together agreed upon together with Khadija, Eliel, Dennis, Mirella, Airi, and Luisa. I mean, for me, we don't, we don't must to keep the schedule. I mean, we can break. Of course we can, uh, if there is any Im immediate comments and questions, uh, uh, let's do it. And Because uh, uh, I know that even if you don't take a notes or even if you take a notes, then it's always very um, uh, difficult uh, uh, to come back to the uh, questions. So yes, if, you, if you open it that and put it on the table, uh, is there any uh, straight uh, comments uh, from from the public or other participants, uh, just like raise your hand and I will provide a microphone. Is it's necessary to speak to the microphone because the meeting is uh, as well recording and for the translation, uh, it's very useful to uh, speak to the microphone. So, uh, do you have any uh, any immediate uh, comments or uh, questions? Luisa? So even though if we want to question the structure of the of the meeting, let's uh, let's uh, let's continue. Uh, we have we uh, we have a f few more uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so the second uh, speaker will be Denis uh, Maximov. Is a terrorist writer and independent curator. He is a co-founder and co-director uh, of the Thin Tank and Creative Studio Avenir Institute, with notes in uh, Brussels, Berlin, London, and uh, Athens. So, uh, Dennis, if you uh, let me know when you are ready. Uh, hello. Is it working, right? So I'm going to talk actually in my uh, address about the paper that I proposed actually for this seminar. Um, and uh, it's I will try to build up also a little bit of a dialogue with what uh, Khadija started with. I think it's nice to build some continuity to that. And um, actually, the subject that Khadija, I think, brought in, in line also to the criticism to the formats, for example, and the way how discussion is built, is um, very much relating to the issue how we talk about the things and what sort of words we use um, to name specific um, concepts or specific actions or agencies um, within the normality, let's say, of our everyday conversation. So the protocols, for example, as they defined, for example, it's a protocol, protocol of hospitality, um, 
is at the current form of uh, uh, the, the current Europeanism, European sort of form of the uh, understanding of what hospitality means and what hospitality meant to address is uh, very um, Habermasian sort of. It means that the, the criticism um, is not meant to be voiced uh, in a very direct and precise form, but rather meant to uh, be disguised uh, in sort of a labyrinth of thinking in that, in that form. And that actually brings to the subject of um, opening up the conversation about the meaning of the words. And that's what I am um, dealing with in my work. Uh, and I'm dealing with uh, the uh, subject of uh, hospitality being actually something that probably is not even needed to be talked about, but needs to be actually replaced maybe with something else. And uh, I unearthed and uh, brought into the conversation this, uh, this term, which is called Xenia. And uh, Xenia comes from uh, the archaic Greece. Actually, it was a protocol that was, uh, that was built Uh, that that was built um, uh, in uh, in uh, among the uh, among the uh, um, Greek policies and among the um, pro pre proto state state forms of the political organization um, in order to to set up the relations in between of them that are um, that were meant to create the space in which they can actually build a conversation um, and um, the uh, Xenia, in that sense, as the protocol, was providing the possibility for the agents that participated in conversation in Xenia to see the other not in the guest that arrives to, to participate in conversation, but see the other in themselves, actually. And to rather uh, see the hospitality as an inverse process, as something that you, that you would not do in order to make someone feel good or someone uh, be taken care of, but rather challenge yourself within by welcoming the other. And uh, that actually ties up very much to the uh, uh, understanding of the guest as someone that, who is coming from the future, but not coming from the uh, uh, future that is given to you, or some sort of a future that is meant to be set up a plan for you in, a, for, uh, in, a, in some sort of a foreseeable agenda, but actually future that you don't know uh, and you, you're not able to predict. It's something that confuses the very plan of yourself and the very structure of your understanding of yourself um, that is meant to be overturned by this, by this uh, point. But in general, I try to distinguish between the future and the future. The future is what is tomorrow, tomorrow, and the future ce qui est deviendra. Donc il y a le futur des programmes, des futurs prévisibles, predictable, programs, prescriptions, tout ce qui en quelque sorte peut être schedule, donc prévu. Et l'avenir, je préfère le mot avenir, to come, parce que ça se réfère à quelqu'un qui vient, à ce qui vient, et qui venant, arrivant, So, uh, in order to actually set up, set up the line um, of talking about the Xenia or hospitality um, in the context of that unpredictable future, um, it's also quite, I think, important to see the examples of how the uh, notions of hospitality are corrupt even at the moment of interpretation um, of history, of now, and also of the, of the ages after Xenia was forgotten. 
So this painting, for example, uh, represents one of the xenic, one of the most xenic moments of, a di of Odyssey, of, uh, of the Homeric, uh, Homeric uh, masterpiece, where you see the, the uh, person who is begging, actually, the King Priam, the King of Troy, who came to beg for the body of Hector, of his fallen son, uh, to be given to him by Achilles. And you see that the set of, the set of this painting is suggesting that Priam is actually begging indeed for it. Priam is in, in a power position where he is actually subdued and he feels uh, his spe specific power dynamics, which and uh, this actually represents, meant this painting meant to represent one of the most scenic moments of, um, of uh, Odysseus. And uh, I would say that it's incredibly wrong painting in, into the sense of what that, what that um, uh, event is meant to represent. But this sort of imagery, if you are, for example, going through the, um, the history of representation of Odysseus over the time of return uh, in the Renaissance to the subject, this is a typical way of presentation of the scene. And this scene is completely unxenic while hospitable because the whole, from the perspective of hospitality, uh, Achilles is inviting Priam into his house, but as a subdued guest, as someone who comes to ask for something. While actually the origin of the Odi of the of the of the actual um, of the Odyssey, if you actually read also the Odyssey, Priam was invited by Achilles to to join him in his quarters and was offered food and was offered lodging without any idea or the form of subdued power relations beyond that particular space. That, and that's what. Xenic space, and that's how Xenic space different, differentiates from the hospitable place, or place of hospitality. The place of hospitality does not exclude the power relations positions. It does not exclude, exclude the programs. It does not exclude the expectations in a way. While Xenic space is meant to be the heterotopic um, form that actually presupposes that socio-political imaginaries, meaning ideo ideologies, are all artificial. There are no nature, of, no, no nature to them. And there is no point of respecting them in a context of either bringing your uh, idea in this conversation or the idea or, or sort of trying to understand the idea of the other in the relation of your structure of political thinking. Um, I'll go to the next slide, but it's a video, that's why it's a little bit lagged. Another important point of Xenia is recipro what, what sounds a little bit um, uh, oxymoronic is reciprocal unconditionality. And uh, one of the departing points of the one of the departing points of the um, uh, seminar actually was a Derrida's text on hospitality. And the anti unconditionality, anti uh, unconditionality as a subject actually arrived uh, in, a, in, a, in 70s as a subject that was related to unconditional love, to unconditional respect, and a lot of other unconditional notions that were meant to be uh, introduced in the conversation about the building of social. But reciprocal like, unconditionality sounds a little bit oxymoronic because uh, it presumes both autonomous component to itself and totally selfless component to that. And, but I think it's incredibly important in the context of Xenia because uh, this particular painting in here represents Telemachus who meets Athena, who is the goddess, the goddess of wisdom, um, at the very beginning of the Odyssey, the very beginning of the trip of, of the Odysseus back home. And actually Telemachus in that particular, particular scene is protecting Athena who is disguised as a normal woman, as a beggar almost woman, from the uh, suitors of, he, of his mother, uh, from the advances of the suitor of his mother who wanted to rape her. Uh, and the unconditional help that Telemachus offered to Athena at that point, uh, protecting her actually from the suitors without no, knowing who she is, without seeing any status of her and, and uh, without uh, any possibility to understand her importance at that particular moment, uh, convinced Athena as disguised goddess to help Odysseus to start his trip back. Because that actually the very starting point, the Xenia was a very starting, the, the, the elaboration of Xenia started the very story actually of Odysseus being forgiven because of the gesture of his son. Then Another important point um, that differentiates between Xenia and hospitality is the, shared, the notion of the shared autonomy. The hostage and the issue of the, of the uh, distance between the terms of hospi hospitality and, host and uh, 
um, uh, yeah, and being kept, being hostage, basically, are very much intertwined in contemporary as well. While in the, context of, in the context of Xenia, the autonomy of the feeling and the autonomy of understanding of the other is not taken as something that is meant to be uh, elaborated by any form of the moral or ethics. So the conversations, for example, in contemporary politics about the assimilating and integrating migrants in order to make them your own and make them uh, make them the, the citizens, make them, make, make them this hospitable act of integrating them into your society, I would not call it by anything else but just violence, an incredible violence against the, 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 uh, the cultural context of the someone who comes into your space and is meant to bend over to your subjectivity and become one of you. So therefore, I would even uh, uh, suggest that words like integration, like social integration or assimilation are actually words of violence. They are not words of help in, in any sense or way. The same as a moral universality, idea of any moral or ethical universality. The autonomy and the sharedness of the autonomy in, uh, autonomy in that sense um, presupposes as well that the moral grounds that w which are based uh, on which the specific judgments are based in political context are quite dangerous to be highlighted and to be introduced as something that is universal per se, because it's again a, share, a, it's a shared blind spot and a bias within that structure. And again, this painting in here represents Achilles mourning uh, his lover Patroclus uh, at the deathbed. And, um, uh, the, uh, at, the, at the moment of the mourning of Achilles, uh, of, 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 uh, at the moment when, when Patroclus fell uh, in the battle with Hector, the Trojans stopped the attack uh, on, on the, on the uh, uh, Greek encampments because they gave, they gave several days for Achilles to mourn the, the, fell, uh, the, the Patro Patroclus who fell uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the battle, knowing that, uh, that, that for Achilles it was the most uh, outstanding and the most important value at that particular form, at, the, at that particular moment in the battle, which actually provides this um, example of this uh, distant shared autonomy within the Xenic hospitality, which actually even um, a uh, more interesting example, because that is Xenia, which is provided without the visit in itself. It's Xenia to your autonomy within the conflict that you are at the moment preserved. And um, another important point uh, of, of Xenic, Xenic difference with with the difference with hospitality is the notion of registration, the no no notion of register. The notion of register comes to the point of not only uh, trying to offer something to the guest or trying to offer something as a host to someone who, who, whom you're meant to be hospitable to, but register the difference and respect the difference, the, the, the difference that um, is registered not from the perspective of tolerance, which is again the, another great word that is meant to be very positive and nice, but which I also would claim is quite violent actually. Violent to the sense that tolerance is not is not meant to to be inclusive. It's not meant to provide the equal grounds to the to the point to the point of the uh, conversation of the subjectivity. When you're tolerating someone in a in a sense of the language, you are allowing this thing to exist parallel to yourself. But it's not equalized. Um, uh, it's not equalizing the, so, those social political imaginaries on the one particular grounds, while they are actually just imaginaries. They're just ideas in that way. So and which makes them automatically. Uh, equal to each other. And uh, there, this image in here is a painting that uh, illustrates actually the great um, gifts that the, uh, um, that the Maurian civilization in uh, Spain, in the medieval Spain, gave to all the Europe for the centuries to come by saving all the Greek manuscripts that were destroyed uh, over the time by the radical Christians, uh, burning them destroying the, uh, all, the, all the remnants and memories in uh, monasteries that were not biblical, um, and the texts like, and, and the, and the uh, conversations of Aristoteles and Plato that were actually transferred to our contemporaneity through the Arabic language, and then were, were translated back from Arabic to Latin and then turned into the European languages. Finally, the last point that, that I, would, I wanted to, to, to bring, bring into is the uh, Xenia, uh, uh, the hospitality as such, um, 
although it was suggested and discussed in philosophy, is not, uh, from my perspective, a subject that in any way allows you to talk about the perpetual peace. Because hospitality presupposes the conflict. It has the agony within itself that is unspoken, that is not meant to be expressed and is not meant to be reflected. It's meant to be uh, um, basically loosed uh, into the air up to the point of the tolerance again, when this tolerance getting, break in, break, uh, getting broken into the point of a conflict. And um, the uh, perpetual peace uh, as an idea uh, is, a, is, is something that can only, be, uh, only can grow from the perspective of a protocol, from having a protocol that is followed beyond any morals, beyond any ethics, beyond any idea of a specific code that is meant to be um, followed. And um, the example when it goes wrong is the very beautiful philosophic reflection with which I would finish my talk. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And although it's, uh, it sounds sort of funny and, uh, and gibberish, it's actually a very deep reflection on the subject that actually the guest is unknown unknown. And the only way you can deal with the guest as an unknown unknown is to providing the protocol of, the, of the dealing with the, with the specific um, differences that are inevitable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, so, uh, once again, I will uh, ask if there is any uh, immediate uh, uh, comments or questions uh, from, uh, from the public. Uh, if not, we'll follow the protocol. Uh, so, uh, the third uh, speaker, uh, Irie Triesberg, uh, is an independent curator, writer, and educator based in Tallinn. She's interested in overlapping uh, fields between political activism, contemporary art practice, issues related to gender, sexuality, illness, health, and disabil disabilities and abilities. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, uh, Ari, uh, if you can start. Thank you. Um, I want to speak in very practical terms, actually, and I want to share a few critical remarks relating to this notion of hospitality that has become very prominent um, in the discussions around the recent uh, European border crisis, where the concept of hospitality has been a very, it has been a very prominent notion, which somehow frames these kinds of guest and host relations, um, saying as if the Europeans would be the hosts who should take care of the victims who are the refugees. Um, and I would like to argue a little bit against that, um, based on observations and experiences that come from um, actually my immediate networks of people, of art workers and activists who have done this experience of, of practical solidarity work with refugees um, and who, as I have observed, uh, kind of come to these limits of the notion of hospitality very quickly when you actually start um, doing organizing work. Um, so what I'm going to share is not so much like a particular research interest, but maybe some reflections based on, on conversations with friends and comrades. And since many of them um, are connected to the art field, then, then I will also maybe more focus this time on, 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 on practices that, that have a connection to the art and uh, in the context of social movements and refugee self-organization uh, more uh, generally. Um, and if you would ask if the question, how do artists, uh, what do artists do when they when they um, want to support refugees, then one thing that is kind of a re-emerging pattern is that um, often they would go to reception centers or accommodation centers and they would offer art classes. Uh, because, you know, this kind of, it's probably a very um, somehow immediate reaction to the situation using the tools that artists have as artists. Let's go and organize some art classes and this, these art classes often turn into then sort of a, a contact zone where, where actual uh, dialogue 
can come from and, and they, in this kind of camp situation where people are like refugees and asylum seekers are waiting for their uh, responses to their uh, asylum applications, then, then it's also a bit of a distraction um, and, and has a therapeutic uh, dimension often as well. One example, one very concrete example, where art students and artists started going to the um, refugee camps um, is around 2008-9 in, in Copenhagen, um, out of which later a community space named Trampoline House developed from, I don't know, maybe you're familiar with that uh, initiative. Um, and I think it's very interesting if you if you listen to the, this kind of founding narrative of, the, of Trampoline House, then, then it's very interesting in the sense that Artists and art students started going to the refugee centers, uh, organizing art classes. Then one of the first things that came, kind of, that they observed and noticed was that in Denmark the refugee camps are very isolated. They are far away from the uh, from the cities. Um, you have very bad public uh, train or bus connection, and the bus and train tickets are very expensive. So asylum seekers cannot afford to go go to the city. So they are very isolated, live in this uh, in this camp setting. So when these Copenhagen artists started to go to the nearby camps around Copenhagen, then one of the ideas that they developed was this idea that let's organize, let's open a community center in Copenhagen and, and, and create the conditions uh, so that asylum seekers could come to this community center and then we could do activities there together. So they opened it and, and the way it was organized, they would go to the camps and then distribute uh, free transport tickets so that asylum seekers could come to Copenhagen. And once they start doing it, they at some point they notice that, that these um, these uh, uh, bus and train tickets, when they when they distribute them, then the asylum seekers take them with a with a with a certain kind of resentment. It does not make them happy because um, it kind of creates these relations where there are these good willing Danish people who do something for the victims. Uh, and the asylum seekers would feel themselves as charity cases who are handed something. Uh, so, and the, and the artists in Copenhagen, they made a conclusion from that. They, they then uh, realized that, okay, if we want to organize this community center, it's not something that we do for the others. It's not our job to take this kind of role of being the hospitable hosts, that we do something for the others, but the only way how to continue with this project is to do things together. Um, so they developed a model um, of this trampoline house, which is now a kind of user driven community center um, because it's attached to the art field. I think it's also, I don't have time to go into that, but, but it's a kind of a semi-institutional model. So it, it does combine these elements of, of institutionality and, and self-organized practice. Um, but it's also interesting to, to, to think about how they frame these things that they are doing because one of the core arguments that they also use when they need to when they need to communicate with the broader public, they would say, we are the testing site for multicultural, multilingual democracy. While the rest of the Danish society is still very much sort of arrested in these discussions, whether to accept refugees or not, whether there is too much racism or not, whether multiculturalism can work or not, then this is the actual testing site. And, and many, many similar initiatives have come uh, about with the initiative of artists. For example, there is also a community center in Berlin, which is called The New Neighborhood in Moabit, and it was co-founded by, again, an artist, Marina Napruskina, with a very similar, uh, very, very similar sort of uh, course uh, of events. Of course, what happens in those, uh, in those, inside those initiatives is that it brings together people whose legal situation, whose um, economic uh, situation, whose, uh, uh, educational background and, and language skills are completely, are very different and there's a lot of inequalities uh, and, and how to handle those inequalities and how to kind of deal with this dynamics of power is one of the, is one of the core issues in, in this field of solidarity activism. Um, I will now also not go that, uh, to that very much but, uh, but maybe later on there will be a chance to uh, discuss about it a little bit. So, and then I wanted to bring another example um, this is an example of a self-organized uh, refugee struggle from Helsinki um, when in, it was in early 2017, so last year, when, when Iraq, uh, refugees from Iraq and Afghanistan uh, started a demonstration. Um, and these were the people who, because in 2015 there was 
there was uh, the refugees who arrived in, in, in Finland, there was a lot of people from Iraq among them because there was somehow this rumor that, that Finland would give uh, asylum to people from Iraq, which then a little bit later proved to be wrong. Um, and, and around 2000, end of 2016, 17, uh, beginning of 2017, it, was, it became very clear that the Finnish government would, would refuse something like 80% of, of, the, of the asylum application. So the, um, it was the initiative of, of refugees from Iraq to start a demonstration um, uh, under the name Right to Live, which was, which was um, uh, criticizing the politics of deportations. Um, um, and they occupied a public space in Helsinki. It was not like officially, like legally, it couldn't be an op occupation, but they put up a tent, a demonstration, they started in February, they ended, uh, the demonstration f ended in, in September. So they stayed uh, for a very long time in the, in, the, uh, in the city center of Helsinki. First it was in front of the Art Museum Kiasma, then a week later it was, it was moved a little bit uh, further away next to the uh, railway station, which is also a very central place in, in Helsinki. Um, and um, and this image that I have uh, put up here, it um, it again relates to this um, uh, question of how can artists uh, contribute uh, to these types of struggles. So at the moment when the asylum seekers started protesting, then there were a lot, like many supporters who also came to support their struggle. And one of them was um, uh, artist Rika Teresa Innanen, um, who then at the time when she approached uh, the demonstration um, and asked how she can support them, then it was still very much in the beginning. And then one of the kind of issues had become that, that the demonstration was, had just been moved from, uh, from in front of this art museum to the railway station. And the refugees who had started uh, with the demonstration, they started realizing that, that um, the way that the demonstration looks um, kind of produces this very high threshold uh, for the uh, people who pass by. Um, from the beginning, they had this idea to, to set up a tent and to work with this imagery of tents because that was the idea of, uh, of kind of visualizing what will happen if Finland, Finnish government keeps giving ne negative decisions to the asylum applications because people become paperless and they become homeless. But then, like what they realized is that the demo that they had set up looked a little bit shabby. It was not very inviting. Then they also realized that that they were a bunch of uh, Arab and Afghani men, and in this kind of Finnish context, people would maybe even perceive it a little bit intimidating. And and the, and the Finnish people had a very high threshold in terms of approaching the demo or coming to speak to them. So the question arose: like, can we make this demonstration to look a little bit more friendly or appealing or nicer. And that's when Rika, this artist, kind of realized um, that there is something that she can contribute by using her own skills. And, um, and she produced this, this installation. And it relates back to her own artistic practice, where she has used this kind of tree of happiness installations that she has done before. <laughs> so basically, what she ended up doing is that she created a, it's kind of a fence. Uh, because what was also needed at that moment um, was, um, was a demarcation of the territory of the demonstration because at the moment when the right to live demonstration started there was also a racist uh, far-right demonstration always uh, just across the square. And the police had told to the right to live people that you know there's no point in calling the police before they actually enter to your territory. So they needed to demark somehow the territory of the, of the, of the demonstration. Uh, but they did not of course want to build a fence so instead there was the this idea to build this kind of soft membrane, um, uh, which then at the same time, you know, apart from being, being in a way the borderline also became the gateway uh, to the demonstration because they invited people to, to write messages on these pieces of cloth and then hang them on the line and, and, and people who would pass by the railway station every day to go to work or school, they would first come and read those messages then they would write something, maybe at some point they would enter uh, into the demonstration. Um, so it had this kind of, uh, yeah, double function uh, in a way, this installation. And I found it, like now when I was, this week I was actually working with an interview with uh, Rika and then, then I was thinking very much about this installation and I found it very interesting maybe to put on the table in this, in this uh, conversation because also it's somehow, you know, there are these kind of different uh, dimensions in it. Uh, there's a no-border activist uh, uh, kind of approaching to support 
uh, self-organized refugee uh, movement, and the f one of the first tasks that she gets is to design a border. But then at the same time, you know, this border is a very different type of border, and it's also supposed to be the gateway. And then maybe one more and the last point that I want to make is, is, is also um, related to the question of how, how art workers um, can support such uh, kinds of or social movements in, in more generally. And I think this is a very, very somehow fortunate, uh, or maybe sometimes, maybe even a little bit exceptional example where, where artists, when they when they go and, and and participate in social movements, where they actually then end up also working with the tools of artists, uh, and this particular right to live demonstration actually had had many issues with 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 well-meaning artists who wanted to come and support, because often when 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 artists approach uh, social movements, they they would do it with somehow preconceived concepts of what they want to do, and this is a very this is a kind of a core notion in in this kind of practical solidarity work as well, that you actually ask what are the needs of people and, and try to react to those needs instead of coming and proposing something. I think it could be a, a good art project. Or the other th way that artists approach, they would often uh, come and ask if they can film because, you know, they would, and it's all important to document uh, significant historical events, but, but then it's also, it's not about participation, but more about this kind of observation. And, and with this particular right to live demonstration, there was this ongoing problem that, that the culture workers would come and say, hey, we find your struggle very interesting. We would like to invite you to take part in our, you know, maybe our theater play to develop something together, our some uh, educational activities and so on, without realizing that it was very, very important to hold this space because it was an occupation. So, so this kind of support when it came, it, it very often sort of tried to take people away from the place where, where the struggle was actually happening. And, and I think these are also, um, yeah, I mean, in my own practice, I'm, I'm also doing a little bit of su uh, su uh, support work in Estonia, and, and, and what we are doing is going to the detention center. Um, and there it's very hard to find ways how to be helpful uh, to people, but it seems that there are very many ways how to be harmful to people. And I think, you know, when it comes to these kinds of, you know, expressions of, of either you call it hospitality or solidarity, then I think it's also something to be kept, um, uh, to be kept in mind, that, that this kind of hospitality can also be, uh, yeah, it can develop into something oppressive, it, it can be harmful, um, and these are things that, that need to be considered. So that's it for me. If I can have uh, Mirella uh, Bacek at the uh, table. Mirella is a curator, researcher and writer in the field of visual arts. She is interested in the system of uh, transactions that are used for profits around the globe and in crisis of inherent quality of things that makes them more uh, violent. The, aim of her practice is address the uh, contradictions between human needs in terms of ethics and neoliberal conditions. Uh, so, Mirella, if you can uh, continue, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to start with an image um, of a work by Gordon Mata Clark, which is called Splitting. Um, uh, because this image actually is one of the, it's actually a, a, for me a very apt metaphor of how I understand hospitality. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, this, this image gonna stay in the background uh, throughout my presentation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the way I understand hospitality coming from, coming from its etymology. And then I'm gonna speak about what is sort of like at the heart, I guess, of my interest, of my research, which is institutional transformation, and how I seek, or maybe was seeking to, um, to use the notion of hospitality to uh, sort of institutional transformations. But I must add, which is very interesting, that the more I um, sort of operate with the vocabulary of hospitality, the more um, problematic I find this. And I also ca came uh, slow, I'm actually coming to the conclusion that, that maybe this word should be buried um, <laughs> for some context and there is another vocabulary that we need to use. Um, so, 
Yes, yeah, so like at this, ver at this very core, um, the, the hospitality describes the relation between the guest and the host. Um, what is interesting is that when we look at the etymology of hospitality, there is a, there is a, um, a sort of tension between the self and the other, because the word hospitality comes from two roots. One of them is pot, meaning identity, or potis, meaning master. And the other is hospice, which uh, in the past used to indicate both guest and host, so it was one. At some point in, in history, in Roman times, um, sort of this word also went into the direction of hospitality, like indicating that hostis is the enemy. But you can see that actually the, the sort of this idea of, uh, of uh, like the, the, the word of hospitality actually embeds in itself the otherness and the identity. So in the act of, um, so it's the tension between the self and the other. And I think like the way we use um, the vocabulary of hospitality to get today, it's very much entangled by the sort of uh, conditions that we are living in, so like the conditional of hospitality. Um, as um, maybe, to, maybe to also relate to, um, to what Airi was saying and to relate to the, um, to the, to the issue of migration, because I was also thinking actually a lot about it, because I believe that the, the usage of um, vocabulary of hospitality towards migration proves to be one of the most violent ones. And um, I think that if we, if we want to like, create a space for hospitality, it cannot be a space that is actually sort of uh, given or created. It has to be a sort of radically open space for self-empowerment for the other to come. So there's, a, there's been a lot of um, discussion about uh, also the use of the word refugee or can it be replaced by the word newcomer but i think in all these sort of in all these attempts the problem is like is who is actually um, who who has the who has the ability to name who has the ability to give this name and i i believe that we would need more spaces where there's actually just a space for self empowerment to happen so for example to to for for one to name themselves um, um, yeah, and here I actually I'm actually switching to the to the um, vocabulary of or like the maybe the thinking hospitality within institutions because this is a this is a rather tense landscape I believe as for, uh, hospitality within institutions it's always uh, conditional hospitality and there is always an act of invitation being involved. So there's always someone who's invited. There's always someone who's uninvited. There are many different publics um, and there is also a need to like address different publics and host different publics and accommodate different publics. But these different publics do not necessarily have to be um, in, a, in a sort of convivial relationship. And also, when it comes to the when it comes to the institutions, I think like sort of two roots which are rarely, or I mean, they are being discussed, but to some extent, it's a topic that it's sort of difficult to talk to is the economy, so the money. So, who actually, um, who actually within the within the situations of contemporary art gets paid? How does that work? And I think that to to uh, maybe to to like specify a little bit the economy. I think that the two economies that are driving the art field um, are the moral economy and the reputational economy. So the moral economy is basically based on justice and equality, and it is the need or like sort of the the call that we have to um, to uh, to sort of to help the others to um, to create justice justice relations. On the other hand, uh, there is a reputational economy which is based on the reputation of the one who um, bears the reputation and can be like a very famous artist or a very famous curators. So these two economies, I guess, in under current sort of scenarios and conditions within the art field are, are strangely and weirdly entangled. Um, and yeah, well, I'm, I mean, I'm also, the word that I'm actually intending to <laughs> start to use instead of hospitality uh, will be um, intersectionality, because I believe that if if an uh, institution really wants to be hospitable, it needs to be really smart when it comes to the relations of uh, sort of creating sort of possibility of for intersection. 
because otherwise, and I think this is sometimes happening, I don't think it's happening here, um, but like in, a, in a different scenarios that I'm, that I'm um, sort of seeing, there is this uh, sort of phenomenon which is described in actually in, in, uh, in sort of computer science as homo homophily, a very ugly word, but basically homophily um, describes, uh, describes uh, can be described in a way that like attracts like. And it's uh, it's something that is um, that is now being uh, also like discussed within the within the sort of algorithmic discrimination studies, um, where um, where like for example, if you if you're on Facebook, if you do a if you do like a quiz on Facebook, like which Harry Potter figure would you be? So people who would be Harry Potter are sort of put into one digital neighborhood, <laughs> and they're sort of like based together. And sometimes I have the feeling that this is what happens in the arts as well. Um, that actually the people who like each other, like uh, based on similarity, are kind of together, and it's sort of like there, there, there are those sort of neighborhoods or circles that tend not to cross with other circles. Thus, the, also the different publics. So, so I think my interest is in like working within and with the institutions, so that uh, so that the sort of the the intersectionality can be practiced, and um, yeah. Yeah, I think that would be it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Eliel Jones uh, uh, is a writer and curator based in London. His research interests and methodologies uh, stem from the intersectional approaches to queer and the feminist uh, discourse. And if we can have a word from, uh, from you, uh, whenever you are ready. Um, so, hello. My, my presentation is more, um, I guess, I'm showing a, a video in a second uh, that will sort of hopefully um, create some discussion for the later part of the program. But um, my approach towards being here and the research that I've been conducting here, I, I came very specifically, it was very good timing for me to come. I've, I've been wanting to come for Warsaw for quite some, some time for different reasons, but specifically because of connection to CHEM, who, uh, that's a queer feminist collective base here in Warsaw, and an ongoing conversation about a desire to work together at, at some point. And uh, then the residency uh, came about, and the subject of hospitality, again, was something that I had been thinking for, for some time. And Kem happened to also be in a residency at the castle at the same time. Um, and part of this residency was, or I guess part of the, of, the, of the residencies that they've been doing, both here at the castle and previously at the Museum of, of Modern Art, was this idea that these institutions were inviting Chem, so they were hosting Chem within their institutions to host other people, uh, because part of the, the effort of, 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 the, of the group of Chem is to program uh, other artists, other writers, uh, other people to come and use uh, their spaces and to use, I guess, to facilitate things to happen. So there's a double layer that was happening in regards to hosting, so the institution hosting a group that will then host other people interested me but also the particular nature of, of that um, of that hosting the fact that the chem is a queer feminist collective that they are invo inviting mostly queer uh, feminist artists writers participants uh, and that the institution perhaps feels apprehensive to do that themselves directly uh, they, therefore they need to invite somebody else in order to facilitate or mediate that process um, so the response to this and the conversations that have happened um, culminated in, in an event that happened last night titled uh, Do You Host? And um, the event, I guess, took as a point of departure this initial, um, this initial prompt of, of Chem and the fact that they've opened a bar here at the castle called Dragona that operates um, ev every two weeks uh, with, a, with, a, with a party, essentially they host a party. And then I proposed this evening of uh, reading, films, um, performance on, on queer hospitality. And the two main points that I was uh, sort of trying to unpack through, through this very kind of like live um, culmination of research that had been very subjective if, for myself uh, was to unpack two things. Firstly, 
uh, the practice of hosting for the purpose of sexual uh, desire or pleasure? Like how is that embedded within queer communities? Like how do we um, unpack and practice hospitality for the purpose of, of sexual desire? And this includes practices of negotiation, of encounter, of radical uh, otherness, um, of display, exploitation. It, it opens up many different questions. And then the second question was also, what does it mean uh, to think of hospitality and new forms of hospitality when actually queer communities are finding themselves in precarious situations, for example, um, of, of, of safe space building or community building in, in particular places because of the current social, political, economic situation. So it, this felt particularly relevant in the context of, of Warsaw in which, um, that, for example, there's, there's not that many queer clubs or queer spaces. Um, so this idea of trying to to think through what does it mean to, to have a precariousness of, of space and what can hospitality or what kinds of hospitality are needed specifically for the fulfillment, nourishment and uh, desire of, the, of queer um, feminist communities in the, in the broadest sense possible. So I'll stop with that and I'll just play, it's, it's a 10 minute um, film by Kenneth Tam, artist Kenneth Tam and um, my presentation will end there and then we can um, perhaps talk about it later. Thank you very much. And last but uh, not least, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Luisa uh, Provencia. Um, uh, she's a um, contemporary art writer, editor and curator in interested in forms of artistic labor, political actions and uh, collective learning. So without further ado, the floor is yours. And after that, we open the uh, public discussions, uh, comments, questions. Okay. Hello? Yes? Oi? Boa tarde. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Conrad. And thank you uh, especially to all the female workforce of this institution. I actually was remembering that my first curatorial project was 10 years ago, and it was much, very much oriented to a kind of institu institutional critique. And later I became a curator for several institutions. And for me it was very interesting to be in this position also uh, where you have to take the responsibility so I know how difficult it is, and I, I think you are like putting a lot of love and dedication in organizing all these residences. Um, so I'm quite nervous because actually I always uh, used to be on the other side, like moderating uh, conversations, but I think that, well, I would try to manage. I would like to thank you, the translator, and I really would like to know how my voice sounds in Polish. <laughs> <laughs> and I would try to speak slowly. And also, I made, I'm sorry, I made some notes because I got nervous. I, I, my English, I started to mix like verbs and words, so I will read. And then later, I, I hope that we can have like a conversation about all the issues. I actually think that I will touch many topics that my colleagues spoke about, but maybe in a different way. So uh, I came from Brazil as well. So coming from Brazil, a country that we could call peripheral, and where I have sought to work with social issues or close to the so-called social minorities, I feel very privileged to be here, not only in the sense of being able to speak English, uh, but privilege also for having the chance to travel and circulate. However, I must confess that I suspect this circulation or the idea of art as a kind of passport towards a transnational culture. 
And here I make use of some words by Peter Osborne uh, to describe our contemporary condition. So one of the main characteristics of the global post-communist historical present is the penetration of all existing forms, communities, cultures, nations, societies, by the enforced interconnection of global capital exchange relations. And international art institutions are the cultural representatives of a market idea of a global system of societies. They mediate exchange relations with artists. They are emblems of capital's capacity to cross borders, to accommodate and appropriate cultural differences. So contemporary art works as a form of commodification of differences. So I would like to propose a discussion ar around how we, as curators, uh, since we are in a curatorial residency, could host difference and conflict, practicing listening, empathy, and solidarity. But unfortunately, I will not be able to do that in 10 minutes, now probably eight. <laughs> but let's go back to the ambiguity of the word hospitality, that I think that my colleagues also spoke about but now framed in the Brazilian context. In Brazil, hospitality can be read within the idea of cordial man, elaborated by the sociologist Sergio Buarque de Holanda in 1936. Buarque de Holanda created a kind of myth or birth certificate for Brazil, describing the perverse way in which social relations take place. In this concept, enmity can be just as cordial as friendship because both are born in the heart. He writes that due to the relative weakness of Portugal as a colonial power, the family as an institution furnished the norm of power, of obedience and of cohesion. Thus, the cordial man is connected to the sphere of the familiar and the private life of the Brazilian elites. These elites have used hospitality and generosity in personal encounters to establish agreements between them and to impose these agreements to the others, hiding conflicts of their colonial and slavery history. So if today we can talk about a political or even intellectual elite since the beginning of colonization, we have had the landowner elite. What does it mean to be a landowner? It means have the power of hospitality and to de determine the forms of social interac interaction. So the dispute of land is still so relevant in Brazil because without territory, there is no community or sense of belonging. There is no hospitality. And for instance, in the case of the indigenous population in Brazil, um, they believe that the land uh, doesn't belong to them, but they belong to the, to the land. And this is why this, um, these puts are so complicated, uh, because they lose the land, and then there you have a, a massive number of collective suicides among the indigenous population. So the idea of the cordial man was very much misinterpreted or used as a kind of propaganda of a happy, receptive, and harmonious people. And that the contradiction of, is that Brazil is on the top of the ranking lists of the most varied forms of violence. Um, but more recently, this uh, contradictory facet was re revealed through a new political crisis and social polarization this polarization that we have been talking so much around the world in Brazil as well. I believe, however, that art professionals or art institutions in Brazil, even the most politicized or with the best of the intentions, still do not, do not have a clear conscience of their social dynamics or their own agreements. By using these courses of inclusion and change, they forget to look at their own organization and power relations, 
they are unable to recognize other rhythms, languages, forms of production, and cultural exchange. But the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. This is all the law. So how can we reverse this dynamic, which uh, I also believe that it's connected with the idea of the homophily that Mirella was talking about. So maybe, I don't know how can we make these connections between this concept of hospitality and homophily, but it happens, maybe it happens all over the world. Well, firstly, by not shading differences and by identifying who are our counter publics. Counter publics are counter to the extent that they try to supply different ways of imagining stranger sociability. Secondly, by considering that it must be a constant process of self-analysis and this, con this contraction of uh, our power and reactive forces, since these forces are always reconfigured um, and sometimes difficult to be identified. In this sense, it is important to open a space for listening and dialogue. At the institutional level, it might be to opt for a less programmatic agenda, not to work on something giving, a program, but to allow situations to happen, being sensitive to the fluctuations that the process undergoes, and above all, being aware that the director, the curator or initiator is not the only one who is or should be responsible for the regulation of the process. It is necessary disposition from art institutions to transform their own policies, structures, division of labor, methods, and contents. If there is no freedom without solidarity, there is no solidarity without giving up privilege, such as specialized knowledge, social recognition, hierarchical position, or power of decision. So this is my contribution. I actually also made some notes and I use, uh, I, I actually quoted more, more people who I've been dialoguing uh, in Brazil and elsewhere. Uh, but maybe in 10 minutes I couldn't like credit everyone. So, but thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you for this uh, uh, last uh, presentation. And uh, so uh, uh, I would like to start the discussion, and uh, I will refer to the, our p public if there is uh, straight uh, questions, comments. You want to share some thoughts uh, based on what you've uh, heard uh, uh, so far? Just please. Raise your hand, and I will uh, come to you with a uh, with a microphone. So um, it's it's not an exam. So uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, so, like the first uh, notion about uh, what's been presented. I wanted to thank all the residents, uh, all the contributors, uh, for what they, for the research, for the thoughts they shared with us, and uh, I'm uh, quite impressed with how, even though you have different focuses in your research, uh, this conversation or this uh, presentation, uh, like developed in a very integral way uh, from speaker to speaker. Uh, and I think that shows that uh, during this month, as a group, uh, you have uh, created something together, like uh, some small piece of knowledge or um, exchange that uh, I find valuable. So that's just my <laughs> feedback. Okay, if the, we can share the microphone, so if there is uh, another... Uh, questions straight from the public uh, we, we can share and uh, uh, we can share the tool. Uh, 
So, uh, if you uh, if you allow, I I would like to um, I would like to refer to the uh, few things from uh, what you said and present. Uh, I not noticed a um, uh, couple of things that. Uh, my understanding of hospitality uh, was based on very probably naive recognition. But what we received uh, is that the hospitality, hospitality can be a very dangerous tool. It contains violence, it contains uh, moral and ethic questions, it contains as well a uh, relationship uh, of power. And so, uh, First, uh, I would like to refer to the uh, and build a question around the notion of uh, perverse uh, recognition of uh, hospitality. If you uh, might, uh, I don't want to point any any of you directly, but if you might make some comments of your recognition or understanding of the perverse uh, notion of hospitality uh, and now it, especially nowadays without reference to the uh, history or uh, etymology of a word but the hospitality as it is uh, uh, right now and how it is uh, uh, described and recognized so if any of you or someone from the uh, public might uh, make a comments uh, you are more than welcome Yeah. Well, but when you when you say is it working? Uh, when you say perverse, uh, um, you assume that there is some correct way of understanding hospitality because perverse is already negation yeah. of something that exists. But is there? Yeah. My question would be the question to the question: yeah. What is the normal or what is the good hospitality in a way? Is there such a thing as a good hospitality? Th th that will be a, that might as well be an, another uh, mine another question. But uh, I will recognize the hospitality as a form of openness and uh, form of uh, so-called uh, uh, democratic negotiation between different sides and other and uh, yourself or between the states. So uh, so as a norm, if we will so-called uh, that norm, uh, I will call that like uh, openness and uh, and the freedom in a sense. So the perverse is when we start, I, I recognize that as a, when we start control that or impose some situations or regulate the hospitality. Mm. Well, in a sense of uh yeah, perversion of the terms. Politically speaking, mm -hmm. uh, a good example maybe, of course, is Gaza, mm -hmm. the contemporary Gaza uh, situation where the, uh, uh, the population is basically a hostage, but it's also um, meant to be protected by the same time by their host, by whatever is called host. Um, but the, uh, um, the way of also defining hospitality as openness, for example, or as something that is meant to um, preserve um, freedom, or um, it, it's uh, to me, it always sounds a bit like a bit of a cloud of ideographs that that mm -hmm. is very easy to throw, and no one can actually converse or oppose to their meaning in a way because they are again assumed as a universal values. But I would rather think that. From my perspective, it's very important to dig uh, into and ask the questions uh, um, in a sense of what is meant by exactly um, those notions that are constructing that good hospitality or that hospitality that is a code somehow now uh, at the moment, because I don't think there is one, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that it doesn't exist. My answer would be on that, because that form of the good hospitality is defined by the uh, agent that uh, has a legitimacy to impose specific form of reality as commonly accepted mm -hmm. in a way. And, uh, um, then, and, and then through the hard power reinforced via soft power over, mm -hmm. over the period of time. Um, and the f I would say that the, the uh, um, 
essential line comes there from which uh, corner uh, of the problem you address the subject. Um, of course, as a, if you address the subject of the activist, you address it from the perspective of a particular problem. But that's, I think, also another problematics with connecting here theory and practice, because every particular problem in that sense does not um, automatically mean uh, that it could be connected to the theoretical um, uh, framing of the issue uh, as such, because to me this is really a question of protocols, and and the, the and and they are not reflected, uh, and that's what I find very problematic. That's what I sort of also in relation to contemporary European Union refer to as sort of this Habermasian nightmare that everybody knows what they're talking about and everybody agrees on something, but no one actually cares about, <laughs> about what is happening at the table. In a way, it's uh, and it's sort of this. This line of these white basic ideographs like freedom, yeah. openness, and so on, being completely differently understood. Uh, yeah. yeah, it has uh, it has uh, uh, this uh, recent uh, recent situation with uh, Hungary and uh, new uh, act of law, this so-called stop Soros, uh, or uh, recent uh, discussion at the EU Parliament regarding the migration and re refugee uh, issue. It's all contain this so-called universal notion of hospitality based on the Western uh, Western, Western conditions, so very like colonial notion. And so, do you agree that nowadays we cannot uh, straight talking about universal value of hospitality rather uh, than uh, the individual hospitalities of individual groups of, or issues? And it, it and at that point it contains, uh, uh, in my opinion, very problematic uh, notion of uh, uh, radicalization, uh, isolation, and uh, fuel for the populist uh, uh, politics. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, that, that the the context of the universality in hospitality mm -hmm. is on on uh, if uh, hospitality understood mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. It's it's the it's on definite decline, and and it's not only decl on decline in Europe, and on decline globally. In a way, the guardian of hospitality, yeah. politically speaking, is the United Nations with a yeah. Charter of the Human Rights, and uh, uh, we all sort of know that Human Rights Council is a joke, and we could jo joke about Donald Trump exiting it, but actually, probably he was right in <laughs> exiting the Human Rights Council because that was a, a sort of a, a, an institution that was presided by. Uh, uh, Colonel Gaddafi for four years yes. and before that by, by it, it's quite ridiculous in a way the, and it's also quite the point of the UN being that institution that embodies in a way that huge elephant in the room that is never discussed in a way because it, it follows the protocol that is that actually that is not existing anymore and there is basically no um, agent so far who challenged um, the rethinking of that protocol, agent with power. There are a lot of conversations going all around in, in arts, in, in uh, transdisciplinary research on subject of what to do with, that, with those protocols. Um, uh, but finally enough, the alt-right uh, uh, sort of agents and uh, um, like Donald Trump, for example, or uh, whatever is now Mexican results of the elections now at, at the moment of this Mexican uh, future possible president and so on. Those uh, rise of those people who actually uh, narrow down the hospitality in perverse actually way, I think, is a reaction on um, impotence mm. of those institutions that are meant to protect the, this universality of hospitality. So it's... it's um, I think it's yeah, it's more internal problem than it's external problem of the attack of someone on the border of that subject, but rather it's a result of a cancer that is uh, spreading out already for decades uh, over the whatever is called morally um, moral West somehow. Maybe it's a result of the laziness of, after the dichotomy in the world was gone after 1991 uh, with collapse of Soviet Union. You can speculate here a lot what is the maybe the initial trigger, but I see it in a way like this. Yeah, but I don't want to use Europe actually a microphone. So. Yeah. Thanks um, for the presentations. I'm, I'm dying to hear um, 
more about the intersectionality in institutions, because obviously, like everybody's trying to kill hospitality here. <laughs> but I'm really curious about how how you would practice intersectionality and wh what do you mean what do you mean by that? And also, as a side question, what happened to the care work? Because that was also a topic around this whole notion of yeah. Receiving guests, I suppose, is mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. if you want to call it something else. Maybe I'm going to first answer the second, the care aspect. So um, I think like using the notion of care, it's also um, sort of uh, becoming uh, problematic within the within the context of hospitality and of, and of border crisis because uh, care slips very easily into control. And it's also like the question like who's giving care to whom and uh, who's entitled to receive care. And so these... Um, this is a, this is sort of a notion which is which actually I'm very interested in working with, but it's for me increasingly tricky to um, to um, let it sort of like uh, like let it outweigh the economic relations because I think like that the economic relations are always on top of care somehow and you know capitalism does not will never sort of allow housework to be paid and this is. Uh, this is uh, like a very dead end. Uh, I mean, it's I don't know. It's it's a it's a big problem, which which I for now I don't have a, an answer to. And and when it comes to intersectionality, um, I mean, how it can be practiced is basically by um, uh, by making a sort of like a, an analysis of who's invited to speak on the table, for example, thinking about uh, such categories as class, as uh, you know, privilege to education. Race, um, um, yeah. It's uh, I mean, it's it's becoming difficult because, like, sometimes, like for example, class issues are not like or class differences are not easily visible nowadays. Like, you cannot really tell someone's class out of like how he or she is being dressed. Like, this is sort of there's the opac certain opacity in this. But um, I do you want to say but something? But then, so so so. The way you understand intersectionality is more about like politics of representation, then, not so much like who's represented, and that and that because I I sort of had this fantasy that it could be like used strategically in a mm -hmm. way to sort of program who's intersecting with whom also. Yes, yes, and absolutely. What, like, yeah. to, but but then the question is obviously what's like the you know who who decides <laughs> yeah there's of and course there's always someone who's going to decide like that's the paradox of the of the sort of democracy that at some point you know someone will will have to decide um um yeah i mean this is actually about like bringing a uh, different kind of publics to to talk some for example publics that would otherwise never talk to each other or that there is such an such a sort of uh, such a such a such conflict within that you know you don't really want to see the other you don't want to hear the other like you're so that would be this kind of intersectionality would be about that about bringing like radically different um communities together to um to try to work together and figure things out I don't know, if, did, I, did I answer your question? Yeah. I have some uh, short commentary on this uh, notion or terms or um, you know, labels or words. Uh, we try to define or change hospitality, like, or change the um, notion of those who came into the land, uh, whether we call them refugees or newcomers. Uh, the problem of all these terms is that it already contains the relations uh, in the word itself. So we know who is coming or who were there already, uh, or who give the um, who give the hostage and the care. So the uh, intersectionality can be extended, you know, to the notion of hospitality because it have its reciprocity in conditions of relation, also included into this term, into this notion. And also I have uh, the question about this uh, global protocol, which may be the answer beyond the moral sound perspective, as uh, Denise mentioned. But we also came to these problems of power. Who are the power to define the protocol, which is laid, you know, underlined, uh, beyond everything, beyond every process. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I just would like to, to add something to, to the question um, about uh, the, the French philosopher Alain Badiou, that this, uh, just naming the difference, uh, just naming uh, what is different and what is, uh, I, I don't remember the words he used, but uh, just the fact of naming it just um, splits the word in two and, and, and then you, you can't uh, deal with the, the difference because you already uh, named it's different. So it's not uh, just like you. It's if you're naming, if you're using another word, for example, East in this case, or immigrants in another case, or newcomers, as, as you said, just the fact that you name it you're already uh, uh, establishing power for that, mm -hmm. for that. And then you know who is in power, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah, then I can respond actually to, to it. So, like, like another uh, French philosopher, Michel Foucault, brilliantly said naming is power, and now naming is an ultimate power. And as soon as the naming is getting normalized, uh, uh, basically, those agents that normalize the naming are those agents who actually possess the power at that moment. And speaking about the global protocol in that sense, actually, I think it's quite well connecting to what Mirella was talking about before, about the subject that she's grouping with. And uh, uh, it's really hard to find an answer. It's a capitalism. Capitalism defines the protocol of now. So therefore, uh, the value is uh, how the value basically is defined, and how the value um, of the and how, and how basically the, the subjects of whatever hospitality are formulated and that structure are very much dependent on the on the capital flow, uh, as well as the uh, the subject of the of the hostage or or host or the guest in a way on the, depends on the commercial value potential commercial value of that guest. Um, and the notion, even even um, another, maybe I'll throw another stone in in a in a uh, in conversation that line, things like tourism, for example. It's from my perspective, I think it's a terrible thing to promote tourism in a way, and it because it's the most uh, maybe artificial, uh, artificial everything artificial once again, but maybe the most plastic form of um, hospitality. Uh, that is actually getting replaced with trying to address the expectation uh, of the most, the, the, the minimal level uh, of, of, again, feeding the system of, um, of the capital uh, turnover with, on this transnational level. And this is also, for example, a subject that is completely invisible because you cannot say something bad about tourism. It's, a, it's something that is importantly needs to rise and it's something that is supposedly opening up uh, um, perspectives, but actually it doesn't. And more it professionalizes in, the, in that line. More you have Airbnbs, more you have um, uh, structured services within, within um, uh, systematized sort of approach in that line. The protocol of or the, the the protocol that that used to be there. That means that while while you arrive to a new place, you are confused. You are faced with not actually someone who is um, somehow. Um, demands the uh, your attention to this to this agent for example but you are faced with yourself with the other side of yourself that is buried down uh, just because everything was clear before and of course this is the biggest um, maybe problem with the line of hospitality that, that to want this to want that confusion to desire to unearth in you some other level that is only actually possible probably by being a, to, to be addressed by the gaze of the other, by, the, by this sort of reflect. And how to deliver that, for example, value, in a, uh, not packaged as another avocado toast uh, with a, uh, a latte, whatever, yeah. uh, but, but be, be packaged as something else, as education, as maybe art programmation or something like that, that actually emphasizes the value of that. That when you're coming to the exhibition, for example, um, uh, the hospitality of the exhibition is not how well curtails a, a hang or, or, I don't know, how uh, clear is the text on the wall, but how confusing it is, actually. When people are asking, like, what is this? Is it the, uh, is it the festival? Is it what I, I, and, and then the, the whole set of questions starts to arrive, where I am exactly? Is it, and, and so sort of, this, I would, to me, that would be more hospitable act, because uh, you're hospitable to not the normality within the person who arrives to that, to that institution, but you're hospitable to the otherness within normality of this person. You're sort of triple hospitable somehow, in a way, in a way because you help to discover that layer that somehow is hidden deep down. Yeah, that, this is an institutional critique, actually, which inherited to this act. 
but I have a remark about the protocol defined by capitalism, because you mentioned the perpetual peace mm -hmm. that brought by this universal protocol, but the capitalism actually defines a perpetual war, mm -hmm. which is, you know, That's have, a, have a big interest in that. So what's, you know, the alternative? Well, my alternative is, uh, uh, I, again, it's, it's the, the issues are so large in, in a line that, of course, we're not here to resolve the world peace problems. But I think the small acts of language are very important. Uh, and uh, I totally agree with Foucault on the line of language being, the, uh, being the, basically the only currency of power, uh, the ultimate currency of power. Uh, but a part of that, I also very much agree with Jacques Derrida, who, said, who also said that there is nothing beyond the language. There, as soon as you are actually excluded from the space of communication, you're excluded from the space of power, because politics is communication. Um, and in order to change these protocols, uh, I think they are, this is exactly maybe an, ex an example of ground up uh, conversations. For example, democracy is terrible, I think. It's a horrible uh, political system. It was named like that by many theories, but no one talks about it. Everybody talks about democracy being some sort of a great, uh, uh, yeah, great man given system that is, that is I don't know, that, that is uh, somehow is already constructed heaven that we need to reach in some sort of sky in a way. But it's a, ter it's a terrible system that turns into a holocracy. And that was already written not even now. It's not a critique of today. It's a critique of 6th uh, century BC uh, about actually Athens turning from polis into empire, basically. It turned into a democ holocratic democracy and everything went wrong, basically, yeah, since then. Uh, I think we should uh, wish it to... Uh, underline uh, that the democracy in Athens also based on the economy of slavery. Yeah, because it was not it was like, not like that in the archaic period that we don't know we know nothing about. That's where I actually bring out Xenia from. It, it's it's the also the things that even we focus on and that we build the uh, this idea of uh, roman, romanticized past from where we're taking this concept. It's maybe not the best period on which you are meant to base these values in the first place. So uh, that, that's why sort of the uh, I think uh, the discussion about the global protocol and the, the capital within the global protocol could start on the local, uh, on, the, on the most local level. Because I think from the top level, I, to be honest, I don't have an answer. Unless you just have a Game of Thrones solution. You know, you put all the people in a, in a temple and you just explode it somehow. I, I don't have any, any other response to that, to be honest. Uh, uh, because the, 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 the way, the, 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 the power relations are so intertwined and it's the web is so, um, uh, there is too much to lose, basically, for anyone who is already invested into the system. And I would not be, you know, putting the, the, the uh, whatever, saying that we are here also angels of the beautiful future in that sense. If we would be in that position, probably we would also be very much tied up in the situation where we cannot exit already that, that web, of, uh, web, of, web, basically, of uh, uh, power interrelations. Um, the, on the question of how, like, the only one, I think, way how to start some, to do something in that sense is to, I think, to start from the local way and start to... Um, constructs these, these somehow alternative forms of, of resistance in a way, starting, starting from spraying things on the wall, I don't know, and to, to just, but just do in a way, just start doing this, this sort of um, actions. Because, but on the global level, I, like Mirella, I'm puzzled to be honest, because I think we're so deep in uh, SHIT uh, that I, I don't know how to exit it, to be honest. It's, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, still on a third generation of critical theory with that. It's just totality that is so all-encompassing, but yeah. Maybe temple and fire. <laughs> it's a very short comment, and actually it deviates a little bit into the earlier part of the conversation, just relation, that this idea of naming, and naming as a form of power, and naming in relation to insult specifically. So, so actually when you produce an insult, or when you, when you use or you create a word, that is supposed to affect a particular person or community. And as an example, to think as a, as a, as a potential strategy, I'm not saying it's an answer, but as, as something that, that for me it's, is an interesting um, proposal, how these words eventually become appropriated and utilized within the communities themselves as a way of countering their use by the other. So. If I'm speaking very specifically about, for example, the queer community, like for example, the word faggot, you know, historically has been used as a, as a word to, to other, to insult, to, to um, essentially diminish um, gay peoples, like LGBTQI peoples. 
similarly with the word queer. Uh, and it's only when the community understands the power in, in, us, in using that word themselves as a countering towards the use for the other, that that word loses power and it loses the grip. I mean, there's, a, there's another question when, when you enter, for example, in a racialized context and words that are used uh, as um, very sort of offensive words or historically baggage words within racialized contexts. There, there are discussions as to can these words still be used by none from people not within the certain communities for them to still, you know, can, can a word be used and not have power, even though I'm, I'm using it as a racialized person and I think my use of this word is fine, but if you use it, it's not fine. So it's also determining um, where the power dynamics reside as to who is actually enunciating these words and who's naming um, these words, maybe. Who owns voguing, who owns all these, yeah, I mean, it's a bigger yeah, question. I agree, agree very much with Ilya online with, the, with, with what art does also produce. I think it's still a production of the aesthetic strategies, the uh, strategies of resistance, but in a field where uh, it's impossible to imagine these strategies being born on the line of, I don't know, in, in the context of academia, for example. It, the, academia is that, uh, in a sense, of producing any form of resistance in a way, because it's also very much embedded in the, in the structure. Where else you can produce it outside in the, sometimes in the art institutions because they flip through the uh, political matrix of observation because no one takes it seriously. So that, therefore it is still pack of, uh, of production of resistance in a way. Um, and I do think that unless we did, do not figure out something else, we still need to do it actually, <laughs> because otherwise where else? <laughs> in fact doing something? Uh, it can. I believe that it can. I'm, I'm a bit like a Hansierish uh, romantic in that sense. I believe that the art has, can have uh, aesthetic agency to it. It's hard to find the... Uh, um, uh, no, actually, you, you have a quite strong aesthetic examples that, that brought politically quite big changes. You know, Soviet Russia, 1917, it was a very aesthetic project in 1917 with all the social experimentation that was brought into. I mean, another example, uh, Nazi Germany was a very beautiful aesthetic project, wasn't it? The, the, uh, uh, with the power that it brought in, the legitimacy that it brought in, and so on. As a tool, as Absolutely, a, yeah, and it was and it was an amazing strategy of using. It. No one used aesthetics like Romans maybe used aesthetics uh, on the level how, how Hitler managed to actually base the uh, sort of employ aesthetics in line. And I think it's also one of the examples of uh, this issue. For example, is also one of the exa one of the uh, uh, cases of. Um, uh, subjects that are not covered. We have, I don't know, you enter any bookshop and uh, you have a set of books, I don't know, Private Life of Hitler, or whatever, uh, uh, Children of Hitler, whatever, like uh, Pan of Hitler, uh, all these sort of object-based structures, but, but the, the issues, for example, like marketing strategy of Nazi Germany, these are, these are things are, that are needed to be discussed because this is the strategies that are not dependent on particular ideology. This is something that could be borrowed and it's an aesthetic strategy. And what sort of uh, demonic results it brought into and, and that we still, still political science is grappling around how the whole population of Germany could believe in these sort of things. It should not be scared away, but rather it should be discussed. How do you actually, uh, it should, because if you, first of all, if you don't understand it, you will repeat it. And if you will repeat it you, uh, without understanding it, you might repeat it in any form of, in, in any context, which might be the same context or even worse <laughs> in the line. Uh, I would like to add something, uh, returning to a little bit to uh, Conrad's first question, but uh, I feel that uh, it's an aspect that uh, has been like a motive in all your presentations and also in this conversation now. Uh, the, when we talk about the structures of power and uh, the dominant and the dominated and all that. Uh, I think hospitality is a very good example of uh, a situation when um, those uh, relations are never stable, are always dynamic, always changing. And the situation of hospitality is showing exactly that. Well, when you have a host and a guest, um, and of course there is this uh, split. However, in the dynamic situation of hospitality, in fact, those two subjects are always uh, 
changing their position. That a guest becomes a host in some sense, and a host becomes a guest, because uh, like the obvious definition is that a host has a home to which he she invites a guest, uh, and that way establishes a position of power. However, the guest, like uh, Dennis mentioned, is also uh, creating a situation uh, in which uh, can uh, offer something to uh, the host, at least the, the possibility to look uh, within himself or herself, right? Uh, so the guest in that sense, on like a very immaterial level, becomes a host in many situations. And also uh, what uh, Conrad uh, asked about in the, begin uh, in the beginning, about the contemporary hospitality. I think it's uh, very uh, interesting that this uh, subject is being discussed at many conferences, at uh, many institutions at the moment. It seems that, yes, it is a very uh, valuable subject right now. It's something that we need to reflect upon. It's something that we need to change our mentality about because it's alarming, basically. So uh, just a short comment to Khadija's uh, presentation. Uh, I don't want to criticize your perspective. However, the fact that we, like one time we talk about uh, global warming, another time we all talk about uh, gender issues, another time we all talk about gay issues, and then we come to hospitality like uh, en masse, uh, it's not just a fashion. It's not programmed. It just reflects that, or expresses, that there is a huge need globally to verify those categories, to talk about them. Uh, and, um, and I think uh, what's interesting is that uh, all of us uh, have always had that romantic uh, myth about uh, what his hospitality is. And most nations, if you ask them, they see themselves as very hospitable. But now we see it's a big illusion, it's a big lie. Because when you are actually confronted with an extreme situation of, uh, of negotiating hospitality, it turns that we're not. And that hospitality is not uh, a situation of openness and freedom, because that doesn't really exist in a world that is split in two. Uh, but... Uh, but yeah, it's a situation of, of negotiating all the time and, and trying to find that space that is not limited, that is not owned by anyone, but it's actually uh, shared in a way that we all belong here. And uh, one last uh, notion. Um, um, that uh, we did this trip uh, to Brudno uh, the other day with uh, Pavel Althammer, it was very interest uh, interesting and I want to help, uh, like uh, thank the girls that I had the opportunity to join the group. Uh, and Pavel Althammer began his uh, tour with uh, saying that we are all uh, wanderers, we are all newcomers, we are all uh, only uh, travelers, like uh, passers-by, all of us. So there is never a such a situation that someone is actually like hosting someone else in the sense that ho owns a home and receives someone, yeah? Because we are all, we don't have any of it really. Uh, and I think that's a very healthy and uh, interesting perspective. Also referring to what Dennis would talk about, about, about tourism that I completely agree with you, and that's why I stopped traveling. Uh, that, uh, yeah, like, uh, these days, with that kind of capitalistic ideology of tourism and all, the tourists, the travelers, begin to behave like colonizers, and uh, the locals are supposed to become their ser servants, really, or like, 
are being exploited, in fact. So like the, there is always that uh, risk or that danger that the traveler can also be uh, an intruder. Uh, so it's not just that the, the relation of power, of power is not always on the side of the host. It can also be like turned around and, and used in either positive or negative way by the guest. That's all. It was a very long speech, sorry, but I had to say it all. It was very inspiring. Yeah. Did, you, did you want to answer? To I wanted to, to add, uh, I just wanted to add like a comment about uh, about maybe the sort of the situation where the guests can overtake the host's home, which is uh, one of an ideal one. But I think what what is what it actually requires is something that would come from this ideal scenario of unconditional hospitality that you um, that you dispossess yourself, that you open yourself to the other, and you let go of everything, everything that you own. Uh, your self-identity, and uh, I mean, this is by sort of like this is uh, an impossible sort of aporia, but uh, but it's uh, I think it's yeah I think it's good to to think within these sort of lines to yeah at least try to then adapt the conditions the conditional hospitality towards the ideal of the unconditional hospitality yeah. That happens very quickly also in the that's the Kenneth Tam proposal. I mean the video is very much this it's very, I mean if it's just very short because I don't really want to talk. It, it that's what happens in a very specific case. You know, Kenneth is being hosted by this by this man through he on Craigslist, they they meet each other on Craigslist and he's hosted by this man to come to his house to have this this moment in which they will negotiate an encounter of, of sexual a sexual encounter. And the host essentially that's his room and he puts himself inside of a box. To accommodate to his guest, and in this whole the whole process of the video or the work is both of them trying to negotiate each other's desires because obviously the man in the box wants to have sex with him, and that he's outside and he doesn't want to have sex with him. So they have to negotiate what how this encounter is gonna exactly how the exchange is gonna happen when when you want different things when you have different identities because actually Kenneth is not gay, um, so it's it's a, it's a very sort of like I guess like an experiment in in this that you. Somehow uh, related to like many things that were that were uh, that were said here, I just uh, um, can't st stop myself because I have this image from the beginning of the of the seminar, and it will be actually a question to to Mirella because I I feel that this exercise was so significant and. Um, and uh, because in the beginning of the seminar, we, uh, led by Mirella, we uh, participated in a sort of like Hellinger constellation uh, where, uh, where each of us was, uh, um, we were given, um, we were given uh, tools, papers, uh, and we should write things that we associate with hospitality. And out of this uh, exercise, what I remember like very strongly was that this division between like guest and host, they were like really far from each other. In the, in the middle appeared a hostage and we really didn't know what to do with the hostage. There were two cares, too much care, and then we actually didn't know how to assign the care and which direction. And um, I'm wondering like, what would have happened if we actually read this exercise, because it seems to, to, to show a certain situation. I'm actually like, extremely amazed by how in the second or third day of the seminar this actually showed. And, and I'm, I'm a bit sorry that we didn't, that we didn't take enough, uh, um, uh, uh, we didn't took it enough mindful to, to go through it and, and to read it uh, and to, 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 to learn more. But perhaps that's the, that's the pace, how to, how to learn some things. But I, but I had a question to you, whether, whether you had, um, di, di, did, you, uh, did you do something with this, with this exercise? Did you have some more, um, uh, I don't know, uh, reflections on, on this particular uh, on this particular situation. Yeah. Maybe one thing like as Robert Kishel said yesterday in the video, there is nothing to regret, we can still do this. <laughs> there's, uh, there's still like, there's still space and thing to, to like continue and be done. Um, I mean, I am working with this, with this exercise because uh, I mean, the, the one that we did at the beginning of the seminar was a sort of like an experiment without leadership. 
So in a way, like in the in the family constellations, um, adapted to the institution. Um, the question is, is there sort of the figure of the therapist who sort of controls the, the constellation? Um, I decided to experiment this time like sort of without this figure. And I think then we also reached the, some sort of some sort of point where it's just slipped into uh, discussing where wh what, where are we what how can we change it without actually changing it. But I think I will actually continue um, working uh, within with with this with this method, but with uh, sort of uh, in introducing at least two stronger figures. Um, so, I mean, stronger by, by by meaning that sort of two figures that would be a little bit outside of the institution that would have uh, that would have some sort of agency or like negotiation that would con that would ma mediate the negotiation because like if no one mediates the negotiation like it can it can like get very it can get stuck um so yeah <laughs> Um, I don't know if I answered your question. I think I, uh, yeah. Yeah, but it was really like, um, I mean, I really, yeah, it was a great exercise to do. And for me, many, because I was the hostage, like in the thing, that was like, for me, many really interesting things then came up to that I will definitely continue. Um, just to add uh, Joana's um, observation, I would like to ask something for you and, and Dennis and maybe Luisa because uh, Sergio Buarque's notion of uh, hospitality is very different from what I'm seeing here in Poland. Uh, what we Brazilians call hospitality is something very different from uh, what we uh, see in Europe mo mostly and, and here in Poland. It's m m way different than the, the other countries of Europe that I know. But, um, Adding to that, um, the, 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 the themes, the themes of, uh, of uh, eco problems, or the themes of uh, I don't know ethnics, or the, the, the theme of um, the theme of hospitality here in this case, is not a, a question of fashion, but it's a question of uh, if the institution is, wants to talk about. Uh, global warming or if the institution wants to talk about hospitality, it's impossible not to, to, to relate things. So if you're talking about uh, eco-friendly environment or something like, something like that, you can't print thousands of books. If you, if you want to discuss uh, global warming, for example, it's impossible. If you can't discuss uh, global warming printing more books. It's, uh, yeah, I think what Danis was, was talking about relates to that because you, you must do something and while you are you uh, aiming for talking about some, something like that. And then um, again, I, I would like to, to, to remember the, the, another French uh, current of, of philosophy that, that's called uh, the croissance, uh, the, the growth. When you, you you can't change everything from, from one day to the other, but you can do a little bit less. You can produce less, you can uh, maybe work less, or uh, this is the concept of the growth, to, to think what, what we are, the, the engine that, that we, are, we are working with, just uh, producing less, just uh, um, asking, asking how we are, how we are discussing uh, global warming, for example, producing a lot of, of garbage, for example, or how we are discussing hospitality uh, without being uh, hospital to, to your guests, for example. This, uh, this is the, the oxymoron, as you said. I, I don't know if it makes sense. Uh, I just want to uh, give another comment to a comment because you referred to what I said, and I completely agree with you that uh, uh, discussing theoretical categories within institutions uh, create that kind of that kind of a paradox because uh, we are in this privileged uh, position to discuss very conceptual uh, subjects while we are adding to the problem in many ways. I think it's not only an institutional problem, like uh, we are all in the system and like if we just live, we adapt to it, that. But uh, my point was that uh, if uh, those uh, 
uh, subjects pop up and like uh, spread and uh, appear in different contexts at diff in different places that only expresses that there is a, a, a strong need uh, like among people to discuss those things. So that was my whole point about like why we need to discuss it and like why we need to discuss certain things at a certain time. It's not a matter of fashion in my belief, it's uh, because people need to discuss it. <laughs> and I have uh, an addition uh, to this attitude of particular topic, you know? Uh, the institution speaks about the particular topic, so the institution decides the topic, the institution divides, mm, you know, the society between themselves and the audience. Uh, so even when it speaks about the ecology, it starts to print the books, as you mentioned. So it's always happened because, uh, you know, institution lose its ethical roots uh, in which it's supposed to, you know, supposed to follow particular ethics or particular, uh, how to say, the vision and became like uh, an instrument, a tool of reproducing its activity just in case of institutions. So I think that we should mostly focus uh, on some ground level of some particular ethical values rather than on institutional activity. So not to reproduce this way of giving a topics and then talk about these topics or follow the intellectual fashion, but rather to make more activities on the ground, from the ground. I also would like to answer, actually, I can't maybe yet answer uh, the differences between the hospitality defined uh, in like 80 years ago in Brazil and uh, Europe because I haven't spent so much time in Europe. Maybe there is this uh, class and race difference, which is in Brazil is very strong, the division uh, between the white and the black and the indigenous. But I totally agree with you that we must like uh, gather uh, uh, theory and practices that we, we talk too much, but we don't do what we are like speaking about. And this is why this, I also believe that this um, intersectionality uh, could also not only functions in terms of an inclusion of of the other or, or some, someone different, but also, uh, well, to understand that this difference is not only uh, in terms of race or gender or whatever, but also in terms of these other modes of doing other modes of existence. So, uh, for instance, uh, recently I heard that, oh, we don't have like uh, black professors of art history in Brazil, what can we do? And of course we do have, but it's not this art history that you want to listen, it's a different art history. So we need to adapt ourselves to, to understand these other modes of understanding. And and this is why I think so difficult. And also I agree with, uh, I think that Khadija and, and Chico, they are like insisting this, in this very much that sometimes we look very much uh, to the outside and we totally forget what is happening inside. So it's very important to look to our own relations inside, like our, uh, this is why I, I called the, uh, work divisions, how do we organize ourselves, is this department talking to the others, is this, I don't know, what is happening with the cleaners, with the guards, Mariana gave a very nice example of, of her exhibition last year uh, with, with the security guards of the exhibition and they were like really involved in this and this is great, I think you should do more uh, this kind of practice to involve uh, them in the process of uh, producing uh, things in the castle, for instance. So I understand like uh, this order, this audience, this, I don't know, this, um, I don't know, this, this, this <laughs> mixing with Portuguese, but um, 
and understand these people as also political subjects that can really intervene and can be also artists and cultural producers. I mean, um, and then one, just one thing that I, I thought that was very interesting for you when you were like talking about um, the, um, how the host can be the, the guest. I remember, I don't know if this can be useful or not, but there is a very a beautiful uh, sentence by the educator Paulo Freire from Brazil. And he says, he defends an education for freedom, otherwise the dream of the oppressed uh, will be to be the oppressor. So it's, it's a very nice uh, quote by him. one thing towards like the attitude towards the institutions um, that what you mentioned and you mentioned a little bit like I think um, I mean I would not like lose totally faith in institution and like then rely on the grassroots initiatives because like I mean I don't know at the end uh, the institutions have potential of this sort of shifting the discourse as sort of the um, Eliel put it like sort of this epistemic transformation and uh, and this is, uh, yeah, this is something that I guess could be just uh, used, <laughs> to put it very, to put it very simply. Because I think there is this also, you know, critical tendency to like, to oh, the institution is bad, it's bad, it's bad, but it's creating this hostility. Okay, but like, of course, like the institution can be bad, but and there are like many negative, you know, uh, things about, you know, we now having this discussion and using a lot of power and so on and so on. But, but, uh, but we are actually we're doing this also with a sort of uh, a sort of uh, agency to use this knowledge that we now produce together in in the sort of in the future in in projects like to 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 work towards a change. So that's just in how do you say it? Um, yeah, I like the word whatever. <laughs> Defending the institution. <laughs> yes. Can I respond? Um, well, first of all, um, if I became uh, the other side of the, the host guest situation, it, it's, I mean, I'm, I work with the institutional critique and I think it was only uh, to be expected. Um, and then I also find that like right now at this point, uh, you guys who represent the institution are very much on focus of the critique, which is not, I mean, to be, uh, I don't want to hurt you personally. That was not the, the intention. And I, I, I really feel the, the, there's a personal commitment in, in making an effort to be hospitable or eco-friendly or whatever is the topic of the moment. Uh, not about fashion, but I think there is a flux of money and interest and things that leads us to talk about certain things at certain points. Mm -hmm. And there are various kinds of institutions. Um, some are more flexible than others. Some are more influenced by the capital than others. But as humans within or outside institutions, um, whatever th is the theme that we're talking about, I think the question is always how to bring it to the body how to bring it the most human level. And, and perhaps it's not about uh, burning the institutions or maybe burning us all humans. We're horrible. Um, the, the problem is, is how do we, we go beyond the words and beyond the actions and really bring it to ourselves? And, and sometimes it's really hard to say, hard to deal with it. Um, this question of power is at every single conversation, at every moment, in all relationships. Um, and, I mean, I, I felt I had to be a bit critical because it, it is, I mean, if the topic was soccer, maybe we wouldn't be suffering so much. Maybe it was not so hard to bring to the body. But the question of hospitality is difficult to bring to the body, and it hurts, and it's difficult, and it's difficult to say this or that. Um, 
without hurting feelings of, or each other. But I think it's, to me, and I mean, you also spoke about it, um, I think we are all talking about a, a capital influx and uh, something from abro above and a pressure from this bigger sense of society. And in a way, I think, Time is always the, the thing that we're losing. It's, we're rushed to make decisions, we're rushed to, to say in a certain way, and, and we don't listen as much as we should, we don't stop, we keep producing, we keep doing things without thinking, and, and I do that a lot. Um, we, we all do it, but how can we stop and do less and produce less and consume less and just be? This would probably save a little bit of world. You know? Anything added to that conclusion? Do, do, do less, produce less. Uh, I think that uh, if there is no other additional comments and questions, I would like to thank you, our... So, Mariana, yeah. would you like to add something? <laughs> <laughs> I think that by, by, uh, by this time, everybody's like, probably like starving. So, <laughs> we all would like to extend uh, our invitation for, for you to join us for a meal and a glass of and a glass of wine, uh, which is going to happen outside of the laboratory building next to the oven. And if it's too cold, we can move with the food inside. And now Konrad has his final word to close the session. No, I would like to thank you for your uh, contributions and, uh, and the discussions. I hope that every single of us will uh, take something important from that uh, discussion and subjects. Uh, thank you once again for being here and thank you audience to uh, participate at uh, Sunday afternoon. And let's uh, enjoy the meal together. Uh, outside or inside, uh, and exchange co co exchange conversation in a less formal way. Thank you very much. Thank you.